Okay, so our second presenter of this session is David Biven, and he'll be speaking on my father in Israel. David Biven first arrived in Israel on July 4th, 1963, at the age of 23 to study Hebrew at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem on a Rotary Scholarship. In the fall of 1963, Anson Rainey invited David to this congregation here at Baptist House where Bob Lindsay was pastor and led a Shabbat morning Bible study on the Synoptic Gospels. Here, David met his wife, Joseph, and they were married in 1969 on the tennis court right behind us in the area of the parking lot today. David continued on in graduate studies at Hebrew University and became a disciple of Bob Lindsay and a church elder at Baptist House. He has spent the last 52 years living in Israel and traveling throughout the world, teaching and sharing about the Hebrew background of the Greek Gospels. He has directed multiple modern Hebrew opans throughout Israel. Not just in Jerusalem, but throughout Israel. Founded the popular Jerusalem Perspective magazine and was the key, key leader for instituting the Jerusalem School of Synoptic Research, a group of Christian and Jewish scholars that study the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, within their Jewish and Hebrew background. After 52 years, David is considered the longest standing member of Narkey Street Congregation. Please help me welcome David Bidden. Before I begin, we, we need to have a little ceremony. Um, over here, uh, is the last remaining, the only remaining part of the chapel. And I'm going to ask Joseph to come up, and we're going to have a hasarat halot, the, the unveiling in English. Now, what happened was Margaret and Joseph were standing beside the uh, chapel, the shell of the chapel, and they were going to tear it down. And someone was in charge, not Bob. And Margaret and Joseph begged them not to, to, to leave a facade like, you know, uh, Talit, Talita Kumi over here by the Mashbir, near at the top of Ben Yehuda Street. It's, it's wonderful. King George and Ben Yehuda. And uh, so they begged them to leave a, uh, uh, a facade. When they came back, everything was torn down. But Joseph looked around, looked around, and she found one of the, a part of one of the shutters. Now, if you remember, uh, we've seen it already this morning, there were these long green shutters. These long green shutters on the sides uh, I guess uh, it's a wonder any part of those remain because they're, they're wood. And this was a big fire, you know, coming out the windows and everything onto the shutters. So um, if anybody wants this uh, piece, we have to move apartments. So we're giving it away this morning. <laughs> Joseph, come see if you can easily uh, remove this. Go help. So um, that can be preserved. Maybe add a few more slats. Looks like the top part. That's about half of the long uh, <coughs> shutters. All right, right to work. I became interested in the words of Jesus when I gave my life to the Lord. It was the summer before my sophomore year in high school. I loved the words of Jesus. 
but I found many of his sayings difficult to understand. I had no clue that this difficulty was a result of my ignorance of Jesus' Jewish culture and Jesus' native language, Hebrew. By chance, with a capital C, by chance, or was it by chance, during my junior year of college, my father, J.C. Biven, Zichrono Livracha, a blessed memory, a Rotarian, kept bugging me to fill out application forms for a postgraduate scholarship. This was a Rotary Foundation fellowship for a year of study abroad. My father learned about this grant from his local Rotary Club. I knew I had little chance of winning this scholarship, but finally, to get him off my back, I submitted the application. Thus it was that in the summer of 1962, I found myself competing with 31 other candidates for this scholarship. With only a 3% chance of winning, I was chosen to receive the grant. Money-wise, the Rotary grant is comparable to a Fulbright grant. I won the competition not because I had the highest grades of any of the candidates, but because I worked my way through college while participating in college sports. I seemed to the Rotary judges to be more well-rounded. I chose the Hebrew University of Jerusalem because I wanted to learn Hebrew in preparation for a career as a Christian minister. I assumed rightly or wrongly, that my future congregation would expect me to have a knowledge of Hebrew in order to rightly interpret for them the Hebrew Bible. I had no idea that Hebrew was also the key to understanding Jesus' teaching. I arrived in Israel on July the 4th, 1963, and in mid-July, I began the Hebrew University Summer Ulpan. There were only 40 students in this very intensive program. Eight hours a day of Hebrew study. Eight hours a day of Hebrew study. After two and a half months of Ulpan, we 40 Ulpan students began fall classes, mostly in easy Hebrew. But two of the classes had to be regular Hebrew University classes. I remember that one of these two classes was Introduction to the Archaeology of Eretz Israel, taught by famed archaeologist and excavator of Masada and Chatzor, Yigael Yadin. During my first year in Israel, I searched for a church home. I visited all the Christian congregations in Jerusalem. There weren't that many in those days. By chance, or was it by chance, the only pastor who was focusing on the he Hebraic background to the words of Jesus was Robert Lindsay. The story of how I happened to visit Narki Street is of significance. It happened because Professor Anson Rainey made a spe special trip to the Meisler building at the newly built Givat Ram campus of the Hebrew University. That's where my Ulpan was being held. He looked up the director of the Ulpan, the legendary Aharon Rosen, and Anson asked him, do you have any Christian students in this year's Ulpan? Rosen answered, yes, we have two. Anson waited around until the break, then he introduced himself to me and invited me to attend services at Narki Street. Especially attractive to me was the Sunday morning Bible study. There I saw Bob, Anson, Halver Ronning, and three or four other members of the class, books piled high, studying the words of Jesus. That was exciting. By the beginning of my second year in Israel, I was attending the Narki Street congregation regularly. Nike Street, Southern Baptist, Bapticostal, not Bapticostal at that time, but 
Narki Street. In those days, the congregation numbered about 15. <clears throat> and on a good Saturday morning, there were about 25 people present for the worship service. I don't think the chapel would hold more than that. At Narki Street, and in my studies at the university <clears throat> in Second Temple Period Jewish History, Languages, and Culture, I began to see that the key to a deeper understanding of the words of Jesus is a fluent knowledge of Hebrew and a thorough knowledge of rabbinic literature. Growing up in Oklahoma in preparation for studying in Israel with a fellow Oklahoman. I was born and raised in Cleveland, a small town in the northeastern part of the state of Oklahoma, 35 miles up the Arkansas River from Tulsa. After I left the United States in 1963, I never returned to live in Oklahoma, although Joseph and I and our son Natan visited my father and mother every year beginning in 1980, 30-some trips to the United States. Joseph's father and mother had already passed away. After less than a year in Israel, I became Bob's disciple, having a weekly private lesson with him for the next 20 years. Bob taught me about the life and words of Jesus, Yeshua, of course without charge. At first, Bob and I met in his hideaway in Rehavia, but after 1967, we met at Jerusalem House near the Mandelbaum Gate. I was still meeting with him when he and Margaret lived in Sheikh Jarrah in East Jerusalem just, be just before they retired in 1987 and returned to Oklahoma. Yes, Bob was an Oklahoman. So was I and Stephen Notley, Dwight Pryor, and Brad Young. Bob was not only my teacher, he was also a surrogate father. My own father was never able to visit Israel. Bob was the same age as my father, both born in 1917. And by the way, Bob's colleague, Professor David Flusser, was also born in 1917. Bob arrived, arri Bob arrived in Israel for the first time in 1939, the year I was born. When I arrived in Israel, I was 24 and Bob was 45, and he appeared to me to be so old. <laughs> like a good father, Bob worked behind the scenes to find me a wife. <laughs> When Joseph moved to Jerusalem from Kibbutz Misilot to work in the bookshop, Bob would nonchalantly say to her, have you met David Biven? <laughs> Joseph met me for the first time at the congregation's weekly Bible study. Joseph was impressed when studying the story of Zacchaeus, Bob asked me to explain the Roman system of taxation. That's what did it. <laughs> Joseph, Joseph and I were engaged within a month and married within two months. <laughs> the wedding on October the 1st, 1969 was conducted in Hebrew. Actually, I wrote it myself. 19, it was conducted in Hebrew by Bob and, Bob and Professor Flusser. Now, Joseph's got some uh, snapshots uh, or photographs by a photographer of our wedding, showing us and the audience ahead of us and showing uh, us standing there with Flusser and Lindsay right out here behind us, behind me. A hundred and thirty guests were present. Jews, Arabs, Christian, Ar Christians, Armenians, professors at the Hebrew University, Rotarians, members of the congregation, and others. The wedding and all that went with it. Photographer, he had his shop right next door. 
You remember him, right? A Kurt, accordionist. That was for the Israeli folk dancing after the wedding. Food, flowers, and everything cost $150. All the money Joseph and I had. <laughs> the morning after the wedding, Bob, well, first, that evening, Bob drove us out to the Diplomat Hotel where we spent our first night. But the morning after the wedding, Bob drove us to our honeymoon destination, his and Margaret's cottage in Poria in the hills above the Sea of Galilee. A lesson with Bob. I didn't know much when I began studying with Bob, but I was an eager student and I had lots of questions. Here's an example of the kind of interchange that took place between us. It comes from Bob's last years in Israel when I was meeting with him in his and Margaret's apartment in Sheikh Jarrah in East Jerusalem. Bob retired and returned to Oklahoma in 1987, so this inc incident must have occurred about 1985. Bob and I were looking at the Great Confession, an account that is recorded in Matthew 16, 13 to 23, 13 to 23 Mark 8, 27 to 33, and Luke 9, 18 to 22. All three Gospels seem to suggest that Peter suddenly came to the realization that Jesus is the Messiah. According to Luke, Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? Peter answered, the Christ of God. According to Mark's gospel, Peter exclaimed, you are the Christ. According to Matthew, Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. These answers surprised me. I said to Bob, you've always emphasized that Jesus' disciples understood he was the Messiah from the time they began traveling with him as full-time disciples. How could Jesus now be asking them, am I the Messiah? And how could they be answering by declaring, you are the Messiah? Bob had no answer. So the following week, at our next meeting, I asked him the same question. Bob suggested several solutions to the problem, but none of them satisfied him or me. The following week, I again pressed him for an answer to the conundrum. This time, he said, with a satisfied smile on his face, I think I have an answer. In Luke, Peter's reply is a nice Hebrewism. Luke's ton Christon tu theu, the, the Messiah of God could be reconstructed in Hebrew as Mashiach El, Messiah God. Mashiach El can be rendered the divine Messiah, just as Navi Sheker, literally prophet lie, can be rendered false prophet, that is, prophet of a lie or prophet of a falsehood, that is, false prophet. The two nouns Mashiach and El are connected in what is called in Hebrew grammars the construct state, a, const a construction in which two nouns are linked together. A construction in which two nouns are linked together, together with the second noun modifying the first. Therefore, Messiah hyphen God can mean in Hebrew Messiah of God and thus God Messiah or even divine Messiah. Peter's answer as recorded by Luke may explain Jesus' tremendous explosion of promises to Peter. On this rock I will build my church. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. For perhaps the first time one of Yeshua's disciples had understood that he was more than just Messiah. Peter's answer may be the most shocking declaration in the Synoptic Gospels of who Jesus is. Apparently, Mark didn't understand the Hebrewism and modified his text to read, you are the Christ. Matthew also modified his text. 
he wrote something that would make more sense to his Greek readers. He explained Mark's Christ as the Son of God. In Matthew's Gospel, Peter says, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Something that most of us have confessed when we came forward uh, to confess Christ. Something about Bob's character. Gary already touched on that. Bob Lindsay was loved by everyone he met. Being from Oklahoma, he was winsome. <laughs> he also was an Israeli national hero. In 1961, he slipped through a UN post and across the border into Jordan in order to rescue an orphaned Arab teenager. Uh, a teenager that he and Mar Margaret had helped raise at the Baptist farm in Petah Tikva, Israel. The boy was being held against his will in Jordan. When Bob tried to slip back into Israel with the boy, he stepped on a landmine. And he and the boy were hospi hospitalized for months in a Jordanian hospital. However, because of this attempt to rescue an Arab boy, which was publicized in Israeli newspapers, Bob became a an Israeli celebrity. For full details of this gripping story, read Ken Mulliken and Lauren Turnage's One Foot in Heaven, the story of Bob Lindsay of Jerusalem. Once, Bob was stopped for speeding near the Baptist farm, which is near Petah Tikva. The truth is, Bob had lived so long in Israel that he had picked up local driving habits. <laughs> the police officer asked for his idea, uh, his ID. When the officer saw Bob's name, he said, Are you the Robert Lindsay? <laughs> when, when Bob replied that he was, the traffic officer handed him back his documents and said, You're free to go on your way. Conclusion. From Bob Lindsay, we've learned to put into practice a great summation of Torah taught by the rabbinic sage Hanina ben Dosa. In my opinion, Hanina's teaching is more like the teaching of Jesus than any other sage of the period. Hanina said, Anyone who people love and are delighted with, God is delighted with. And anyone who people don't love, and are not delighted with, God is not delighted with. Mishnah Avot 3.11. Hu Omer, kol she ruach habriyot nocha mimenu, ruach hamakom nocha mimenu. Bechol she ein ruach habriyot nocha mimenu, ein ruach hamakom nocha mimenu. This reminds us of what scripture says about the boy Jesus. And Jesus grew in wisdom and in height and in favor with God and people. Luke 2.52. Que Jesus proecopten en de Sophia que elikia que hariti para theo que anthropis. Likewise, Scripture says that the boy Samuel grew in favor with the Lord and people. 1 Samuel 2.26 Vehanar Shmuel holech v'gadel v'tov gam im Adonai v'gam im Anashim Anthropis The book of Proverbs speaks about finding favor and approval in the sight of God and man. Proverbs 3.4 Umitza chen v'sechel tov v'einei Elohim v'adam the Apostle Paul wrote to the Philippians, Brothers, join in imitating me, and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Philippians 3.17 Sumi me temu yinese adelfi, que scopite tus uto peripatundas, kathos echete tipon emas. Likewise, we find in Hebrews 13.7, Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their lives and imitate their faith. 
Mnemo nevete ton egumenon imon itines elalisani min ton logon tuceu on anatheorundes ten ekfasin tes anastrofes. Mi miste ten pistin. May we be found faithful before God in imitating Bob's Christ-like character and behavior. And all the people said, Amen. Thank you, David, for that wonderful presentation. We have a few minutes for questions for David and a discussion about my father in Israel. Yes, Dov, if you could come forward. Jordanian occupied Jerusalem. Thank you. <laughs> he was in Bethlehem, wasn't he? No. 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 Okay. I missed it, but okay, and uh, maybe we have a, another question or comment. Yes. Well, that was the import of the quotation from Hanina Ben Dosa. Exactly. The answer is no, no, yes, yes. <laughs> I think we've seen uh, both on Friday as well as today in a little bit more scholarly way how Bob Lindsay um, defied definition, uh, was out of the box, and it was people's duty around him to draw the box larger, taken from Sarah Lanier's presentation and leadership, because he found favor in God before God and, and man. He was so generous, so loving, and so out of the box that the box had to be made larger. Questions? Any further questions or comments to David about... Or David. And it's like in the Israeli army, you know, when you're, you finish your two weeks of training and you uh, have a big gathering with your senior officer, and so they want to know, what did we do right and what did we do wrong? And if, there comes a moment when there starts kind of a murmuring among the soldiers, like if anyone ask, else asks a question, they're going to die. We want to get out of here and get back home. <laughs> <laughs> well, David has definitely had Bob Lindsay on, a, on a, both a practical and a scholarly level as a father in Israel. First coming here on a Sabbath, a Shabbat morning. Yes, it was a Saturday morning. This uh, Bible study that he attended yeah. and uh, Hebrew speaking, which also drew, I know, Dr. Halver Ronning will hear from later today. So. Thank you so much, David, for, for bringing that uh, presentation to us. We're now going to have a 15-minute a break.